John, thank you so much for inviting me and for that lovely introduction. I'm honored you're all here. It's really special to be here on Darwin Day. Can everybody hear me? Okay, great. I'm going to launch right in. Um, as John mentioned, uh, what I'm going to talk about today grows out of the work that I've done with neuroscientist David Eagleman. So uh, if you were a guidance counselor for alligators, uh, you could pretty much give them the same advice as 50,000 years ago. Uh, and the same would be true for otters and for bees. And that's not a critique of those animals. They've thrived for thousands of years, living pretty much the same way, generation after generation. But humans, of course, aren't like that. There are jobs that didn't exist 100 years ago or even five years ago. So I want to start by asking, what makes human brains special? Well, first of all, there's the number of neurons in our brain. The bee brain has about a million neurons. Hamster brain has about 72 million. The rhesus macaw monkey has a little over 6 billion. But we've got over 86 billion neurons in our brains. So that's a lot more firepower. But there are some other important differences. And most crucially, animal brains come largely pre-programmed. Most of their neural pathways are fixed, like links in a chain. Those hardwired neurons are what give animals their repertoire of instinct and reflexive behaviors. In contrast, human brains are constantly reorganizing themselves. We have some hardwired instincts, but we're also capable of much more flexible behavior. In fact, one of the most important discoveries of recent neuroscience is that our brains remain plastic throughout our lifetimes in a perpetual state of neural remodeling. Now, two of the most important functions of the brain are predicting the future and making decisions. It's why we have memories, in order to make better predictions and decisions. So to illustrate this, let me tell you about a sea squirt, uh, lives in the ocean floor, spends most of its early adult life looking for a nesting place. And then when it finds one, it attaches itself there permanently, and it eats its own brain. So no longer having to move anywhere, it becomes the ultimate couch potato, doesn't need to think. Now, in animal brains, the prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that enables us to simulate possible futures. And that's the part in blue. Notice how much larger ours is than even some of our near relatives, and also what a percentage of the total brain mass that it takes up. And that's true of every human brain. So as a result, we have an enhanced ability to speculate about possible futures. In fact, one of the most important roles of language is the ability it gives us not just for referential meaning, there's a chair, there's a table, but hypotheticals sharing them with each other. So the subjunctive case is actually uh, such a phenomenon of human thinking. Uh, you know, if you had come to the party, you would have had a great time. Uh, if you had waited for the few months, the price would have gone down on that car. All of those hypothetical scenarios, thinking in that way, using language to express that, imagine trying to say that in some other way to someone. Language makes it so routine, so easy, so facile. It's one of the great things that it does. Now, there's more to it than that. As far as we can tell, other animals mainly have the ability to envision things that have already occurred. They learn from experience, but they remain anchored to it. Humans appear to have an enhanced ability to envision things that have never occurred and may never occur. <laughs> so imagination can be thought of as predicting something that has never happened before and creativity as making it come true by human hands. The more unlikely the prediction, the more original the creative thinking. And no other species seems to be able to unmoor itself from reality like we can and project into the futures things which have never happened. Shakespeare's Macbeth offers a kind of a metaphoric illustration of this. In the middle of a play, an apparition tells Macbeth that he'll never be defeated as long as the forest around his castle doesn't move. So at first, uh, Macbeth thinks, well, great. When do forests ever move? I'm, I'm set for life. But then his enemy Malcolm instructs his soldiers to cut down the trees in that forest and shield themselves with them as they march on the castle. 
in imaginative way to conceal their numbers. And so something that has never happened before comes to pass by human hands. That's creativity. So to reiterate, brains are prediction machines. Uh, creativity is based on the ability to predict or simulate something that has never happened before. And in fact, studies have shown that if your prefrontal cortex is damaged, you will uh, lose creative ability. It weakens it. Now, neuroscientist Anna Abraham, one of the great neuroscientists studying creativity, says, well, how does a predictive system that evolved to ensure fast, accurate, seamless, and goal-directed action all of a sudden give rise to novelty or originality where goals are unclear and the situation is open-ended and unpredictable? And that's a really great question. We got this predictive machinery to be right all the time, but creativity involves experimentation. How did that happen? And the answer is because of each other. So human beings are one of the most, uh, excuse me, one of the few social species on the planet. So we're not the fastest or the strongest or the fiercest, but our ability for cooperation and teamwork has been vital for our survival. And in fact, uh, group rearing of children is one of the reasons we're all able to sit here in a great institution of learning because the, when group uh, sharing of raising of the children occurred, childhood could last longer and our brains could grow bigger. So literally, we owe Lone Star College to decisions made hundreds of thousands of years ago by our ancestors to allow for the group sharing of uh, children. Now, collaboration, therefore, is very important to us. But in, able, in order to engage each other socially, we have to overcome a phenomenon called repetition suppression. So these three pounds of white and gray matter we carry around on our heads are very energy intensive. They use about 20% of the body's energy. Three pounds out of my 198 pounds and yet 20% of my body's energy going to run that machinery. And a million years ago, long before refrigerators and 24 hour mini marts, wasting energy was very risky. So our brains evolved to be ruthlessly efficient. If the brain recognizes that a stimulus is repetitive or predictable, it pays less and less attention to it. So, and that's a phenomenon, uh, as I mentioned, called repetition suppression. If you've been married for any amount of time, you have experienced it. Um, and here's an example of an experiment where they show someone the same so-called surprising stimulus, but exactly the same over and over and over again. And you see, the third time they show it to the subject, a lot of their brain is lit up. Look at what happens by the time the 24th repetition happens. It doesn't seem like the brain even notices at all. So we tune out to the familiar. And that's a problem if we want to bond with each other and maintain long-term relationships. We can't keep zoning out. But surprise engages us. Our brain gets excited when it experiences something new or unexpected. So we have a biological mandate to surprise and impress each other. Our ability to imagine possible futures and our social natures are in a virtuous loop with each other, supercharging our creativity. Evolutionary scientists point to two other phenomena of humans, uh, the early humans. One, we were some of the planet's greatest wanderers. In fact, over time, we basically covered every part of the globe, we can live in any environment. And number two, here down on the right, uh, we, uh, to feed our growing brains, which were so energy intensive, we actually had to become more flexible with food than any other animal. And so we became chefs so that when we uh, decided to, for instance, eat fish for the first time, we wanted to make sure it tasted good. So you add that into the mix and our imagination, our social nature, our wandering and being chefs, again, supercharges our creativity and turns us into who we are. What we're discussing right now is true of every human brain. Every one of us is walking around carrying on our shoulders the most inventive piece of machinery nature has ever made. So, humans are very creative. Where do new ideas come from? And I want to start with a little bit of theater improv. Forgive the quality of the clip that's pulled from YouTube, but it's a, a, an example of what scientists often look to as a, a spo very spontaneous, unfettered creativity. Um, here is it's from the show, Whose Life Is It Anyway? 
going to play a game for you called Props. Ryan and I are going to take a pair of props. This is for me and Ryan. That's for you and Ryan. Oh, great. And you guys take your props, these and we're going to go back and forth and see oh, what the? many funny things we can think of with these props, starting with me and Ryan. <laughs> Hope we find some nuts today. <laughs> Sit. <laughs> Riddle me this. Rick em, rack em, rock em, rock em, get that ball and really fight! Come on, Rudolph, we have lots of houses to go to today. <laughs> Bring me those Dalmatians, quickly! <laughs> well, Scarecrow, it doesn't look like it's going to take a long time to find the wizard. Nope. <laughs> Bring her through. Okay. So let's think for a moment about what we saw. Everything that they were doing, as spontaneous as it was, was all riffing off the familiar. We had a car wash, we had 101 Dalmatians, the Wizard of Oz, etc. So that's a way of illustrating that all creativity is based on prior experience. Look at any invention closely and you can see its family tree. Every new idea comes from a lineage. Now two recent medical cases are instructive about this. Uh, Lonnie Sue Johnson was a very successful graphic designer. She did a lot of covers for the New Yorker magazine. And in midlife, she was stricken with brain encephalitis, which destroyed her long-term memory. And as a result of that, she still wanted to be creative, but her memories being so impoverished, she was no longer able to do it, except for word puzzles, because her language center of her brain was the only part of the brain that was unharmed. So that's an illustration of how much we have to draw on our resources of knowledge and experience in order to create. And then there's the story of Susie McKinnon, uh, who has a very rare uh, genetic disease. She cannot create biographical memories. So she lives in a 15-minute slice of the present. She can't remember her childhood, ever going on vacation. Her husband says they're very happily married because she never remembers that they argued. And for our purposes, what's interesting is that if you ask her, like, where would you like to go on vacation next? She doesn't understand the question. She doesn't know how to answer. Thinking about something in the future makes no sense to her. Again, without memories to draw upon, there's no way for her imagination to function. So. Human cre creativity consists of cultural strata, with each generation building on precedence. For instance, here is Picasso's take on Delacroix's painting, The Women of Algiers, and Lichtenstein's take on Picasso. And culture is fundamentally such a fantastically important thing for human beings. First of all, it keeps us from having to reinvent the wheel with every generation. We pass on knowledge, but even more importantly, we get to build on it. And one of the cool things about culture very often is it still preserves the past while it allows for the derivations to come into being. So as an example, let me play you this. So fortunately, no Bach was harmed when Walter Murphy turned it into funk. And so that's what culture does so beautifully. We still have Bach, but also we have something that came out of the Bach. So if all creativity comes from prior experience, how do new ideas evolve? And in our book, David and I put forth a, an, a, an argument that in creating new derivations of existing things, our brains rely on three basic cognitive tools, as John mentioned. Bending, breaking, and blending. In bending, an original is twisted out of shape or transformed in some way. In breaking, a whole is taken apart and something new is made out of some or all of the pieces. 
and in blending, two or more sources get merged. Bending, breaking, and blending, working together, enable us to draw on our experiences to imagine things that do not exist yet. Now, a lot of time creativity is hidden from us and even inaccessible. Think about an iPhone. It takes a special screw called a pentalobe, which you have to get directly from Apple in order to open it up and see all the creativity that's on the inside. One reviewer on a book of the, about the iPhone said, the iPhone knows everything about us and we know nothing about it. <laughs> the person who actually invented the touch screen that makes the iPhone possible had to sign a non-disclosure agreement and then he had to sign a non-disclosure agreement that he'd signed a non-disclosure agreement. That's how buried his contribution had to be in the iPhone. One of the greatest contra cultural contributions of the arts is that they take the creativity that is often hidden around us and they put it on display. They expose the innards of the creative process. So now let's look at how bending, uh, breaking, and blending are reflected in various art forms. Let's start with architecture. Here's an example of bending from the architect Frank Gehry. The orange cube in Lyon is an example of breaking. It's got holes of various sizes all throughout the building. Bjarke Ingels' uh, building here is an example of blending because there's a mountain blended into the facade of the building. In visual art, this de Kooning self-portrait would be an example of bending. This is a plate painting by the artist Julian Schnabel. It's a portrait of the uh, actor Dennis Hopper, and you can see that he shattered plates and then painted on them as an example of breaking. And Frida Kahlo's wounded deer is an example of blending. In film, slow motion is the bending of time's flow. This is from The Matrix. Jump cutting, so editing out segments of something that's happening chrono chronologically in order to speed up the action, that's an example of breaking. So we're gonna watch a clip from the movie Spider-Man where they're gonna rob a bank in the basement and escape off of the roof in a helicopter in 15 seconds thanks to breaking time's flow and editing out a lot of the action. Here we go. And they're off. And double images are an example of blending. This is an experimental film by Magali Charrier. So in music, a theme in variations, jazz improvisation, covers of songs, those are all examples of bending. So you're taking an original and you're transforming it into some new version. Let's just listen to a clip of Judy Garland singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Here's the Bourbon Street Stompers version. And second edition. Somewhere over the rainbow, way and is there ever an end point to this? Is there ever a point where you say, okay, that's the last variation anybody's ever going to write on somewhere over the rainbow? And the answer, of course, is no. That's the amazing thing about human creativity. There is no end point. Uh, fragmentation of a theme is an example of breaking. So we're going to listen to the opening of Be Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony. Now, Beethoven's going to take a little fragment of the middle of the theme, bum, ba da dum bum and he's gonna make an entire passage just out of that. So you'll hear the passage start, and at the end of this excerpt, the whole theme will come back again. That's just a fragment. Still just the fragment. Oh, 
kill the fragment. And now the whole theme again. Playing two or more themes at the same time, which is called counterpoint, is an example of blending. So here is a theme from Prokofiev's Lieutenant Kijay. Now later in the piece there's this lively theme. Those two themes are combined. So the argument here, of course, is that what Frida Kahlo is doing in Wounded Deer, what Bjorka Engels is doing in his building, what Prokofiev is doing in his music are essentially the same cognitive tool. They're taking two different sources and they are combining them. And so the argument here is that all the arts share these fundamental cognitive tools. But of course, it's more than that even. It's how the arts connect to the rest of life. So for instance, human language is designed to bend, break, and blend, so we can constantly update what we say to each other. So in, in, for instance, in French, there's a type of slang called verlan, where you flip the syllables of a word. So français becomes c'est franc, méchant becomes chan mé. This was originally invented by urban youth and criminals, so they could talk secretly without the police being under, able to understand them. But Verlan words became so commonplace that they are now part of colloquial French. Uh, Twitter slang is an example of breaking. You know, most of the letters of the word are taken away. And languages are filled with word blends. All of these words just, you know, literally just picked arbitrarily are all example of multiple words that have been glued together. We are constantly making up new ones. So we're surrounded by variations on themes. So for instance, why do we need hundreds and even thousands of ways to write the same words? Because of our compulsion to bend. We make variations on doors, on furniture, on soaps, on pasta. Why do we need pasta in so many different shapes? They all taste the same. Because we love to take things and transform them. It's just part of our nature. We also break things, for instance, by poking holes into them to create a skylight, or the F-hole of a violin, or different types of shower heads. And we'll take a solid shape and slice it up like this suit of armor so that it can bend. Or this movable cast, so while your arm can, is healing from a broken bone, you can still move. Or uh, time release of brain scans, time release medication. And we blend all the time, for instance, creating a houseboat, a roof garden, fusion cuisine, a Swiss army knife. The human mind is like a kitchen. Our storehouse of experiences provide the ingredients which we then bend and break and blend to create new mental recipes, such as these edible balloons made with green apple puree and helium, the world's first floating food. <laughs> so now let's explore some features of a creative mindset. First of all, no matter how perfect the past may seem, don't glue down the pieces. We show our love for something by turning it into something new. So for instance, here's El Greco's portrait of an artist and here's Picasso's version. Picasso didn't paint that version because he thought there was something wrong with the El Greco. He did it to honor it, to keep it in the cultural DNA. And what that tells us is that it's important to go beyond imitation. So here are some wonderful examples of kids in an art class imitating Picasso paintings. 
And maybe you've heard of courses like Picasso and Pino, where you go to some wine yard and drink wine and Im imitate Picasso. Well, just the imitation part, of course, is a great way to build skills. It's a great way to learn about art history, but no creativity has happened yet. You are just duplicating what your master painter has done before. But now let me tell you about this art teacher in Colorado. She has her kindergartners to uh, make their own copies of this painting by Kandinsky. And, and here are the little kindergartners all making their own copies. And like in the Picasso examples, if it stopped there, then that's a good lesson in painting and in art history. But then she tells them to deconstruct them and build 3D sculptures. And then all of them come out looking different. And that's the telltale sign of a creative classroom to me. You walk in and from the so same source, everybody comes up with a different solution. Okay, now, it's not always easy to innovate. And why? Because brains, in an effort to be efficient, tend to follow paths of least resistance. Certain neural pathways become reinforced over time and become the ready answer, the first thing that jumps to mind. So if I say beach, you're probably gonna think sand, water, sunshine, suntan lotion, and such and so forth. You're not gonna think of some exotic memory uh, right away off the top of the bat. That's how our brains are just designed to constantly get to the solution as fast as possible. But it's hard to create a surprise by following those paths of least resistance. So innovation requires stepping off of those well-worn paths and exploring the brain's vast forest of connectivity. And the way you do that is by proliferating options, by searching out more than one solution to a problem. So here is Manet's famous painting, Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe. And here are five of Picasso's nearly 200 variations on the Manet. An incredible example of proliferating options. And this is something we can all practice. So for instance, in a classroom in Pennsylvania, there's an art teacher who shows her students a, a, a huge number of ways of painting an apple to show them that there's not one solution to painting an apple, there's all sorts of a variety of ways. And then at the end, she invites them to create what she calls anything apples, where they can do it any way that they want. Now there's another twist to proliferation. It's hard to find the sweet spot between novelty and familiarity. So if you stay too close to the familiar, the risk is you might get passed by. So Blockbuster at one point had 9,000 video stores around the country. It pioneered the software to make sure that the best-selling titles were always in stock. That was their great innovation. So you drove to your Blockbuster and they had Mission Impossible 3 there on the shelf when you wanted to watch it. But as we know, uh, they didn't anticipate the rise of streaming video. So they held on to the right answer for too long and now there's one blockbuster left, I think it's in Oregon. Uh, they got totally passed by. But on the other hand, if you wander too far from the familiar, the risk is you may fail to find followers. So, uh, sorry, here's a QWERTY keyboard. And of course, we're very familiar with that layout. Why are the keys laid out that way? Well, because a long time ago when people were using manual typewriters, uh, letters that were typed one after the other that were too close together would jam. So if let's say S and T were right next to each other and you did the word stop, the S and the T often would get stuck together and you have to take time to pry it apart. So the person who designed the QWERTY uh, layout tried to separate letters that tend to happen very often one after the other. Anybody use a manual typewriter anymore? We all use digital keyboards. It, jamming is not an issue, right? So people have come up with designs like the so-called KALQ keyboard, which is optimized for thumb typing. Anybody ever heard of that? We are so ingrained in the QWERTY keyboard that even though it's not necessary anymore, we are not moving away from it. And so that's an example of going just too far from the familiar. So as a creative person, how do you handle that dilemma? Stay too close, you might get passed by. Go too far and people may never follow you. And the answer is, you go different distances from the familiar and you proliferate not only by iterating things that are similar to each other, but by taking them different distances from the community standards. So for instance, this is the uh, clothing designer Iris Van Herpen and she's got ready to wear clothing you can go into a store and buy. 
but she's also got this far out haute couture. Car makers, of course, are constantly updating their cur current models, but they're also thinking ahead into the future with concept cars. Timex will upgrade their classic watches. They'll keep up with current trends with fitness watches, but they'll also explore far out ideas like the time at your fingertips watch, which fits on a fingernail. Um, going different distances is even a strategy in football. So sometimes coaches create variations on familiar plays. Three positions and sets up on the slot to the right. They go right to the air and the pass is caught by Nelson Aguilar. But they'll also try for the element of surprise more far out ideas like the Philly special in Super Bowl 52. This could decide the game. Fourth and goal. What a play call by Doug Peterson. This play call has a chance to be remembered as one of the all-time greats just going for it. Okay. So uh, now I want to just play for you uh, something from a class that I teach on creativity at Rice. Um, I give an assignment where uh, the students are asked to do a theme and variations on a poetry reading. And uh, they, ha they pick their own source poem, and then they create a series of four variations. But the idea is that the variations should get farther and farther away from the original. Let me show you an edited version of one student's work. If your house is a dress, it'll fit like Los Angeles, red sun burning west, deserts, fields, for certain it will drape even a boy, no less. Boy in disrepair, wandering from shore to crest. If your house is a dress, it'll fit like Los Angeles. Red sun burning west, desert sealed for certain. It will drape even a boy, no less. Boy in disrepair, wandering from shore to crest. If, if your house if, 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 is a dress, it'll fit like I, 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 out Los Angeles dress. This repair. So, uh, I feel emphatically that every aspect of creativity from the cognitive tools to the mindset can be taught, nurtured, cultivated in every single person. And I would also say that I think too often U.S. education has been about turning children to, into adults as fast as possible. I would say even faster and faster over the years. And maybe we should take a lesson from our distant ancestors and try to have childhood last as long as possible. And part of that is encouraging creativity, especially in a low-risk environment. And I will always say that school should be like jumping off a trampoline, and if you happen to mess up or fail, you just bounce right up again and take the advantage while you're in school to experiment creatively, because it's the safest place to do it. So remember that if you have superpowers, you can bend. You can break, and you can blend. And all of you have those superpowers running in your heads. Thank you. Be sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like this video, leave a comment, and hit that subscribe button to be notified about our latest content.